Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're glad you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this, I think, is a fantastic series entitled The Three Angels' Messages. Hmm. This is lesson number four in that series for April 22 of 2023, entitled, and these are in quotation marks, Fear God and Give Glory to Him. How do we do that? Well, this is what we're going to try to discover. Let's pray. Our kind and fantastic Father, our loving Father, your love, your compassion, your experiences here on this earth, your death on our behalf should inspire us to carry out whatever is necessary to finish the gospel. May that be so is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We have suggested now on several of our week's discussions that Revelation 14 is God's response to Satan's challenge in Revelation 13. Look at the following verses. Jim? Revelation 14, verse 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people. Those who obey God's commandments are faithful to Jesus, American Bible Society. Another way of saying that, those who listen yeah, okay. are, are God's prescription or faithful to Jesus. Okay, well, okay, what does Revelation 13 say? Whoever is meant to be captured will surely be captured. Whoever is meant to be killed will be, by the sword will surely be killed by the sword. This calls for endurance and faith on the part of God's people. Good news Bible. Okay, so here we have two verses talking about endurance and faith. Which do you think would require greater faith and endurance? Satan's challenges in Revelation 13 or God's response in Revelation 14? Hmm. Yeah. Carrie? From the Bible Study Guide, VSG, Danish author, Seren... Sean Kierkegaard. Uh, Kierkegaard told a parable about the end of time. It went something like this. A fire broke out backstage in a big theater. A clown who had been part of the performance came out to warn the audience. Get out of the place. is on fire. The audience thought it was just a big joke. Part of the show, that's all, and just applauded. He repeated the warning. Get out, get out. But the more emphatically he warned them, the greater the applause. For Kierkegaard, that is how the world is going to end. That is, to the general applause of wits who believe it's a joke. Mm. The end of the world and events leading up to it are, as we know, no joke. The world faces the most serious crisis since the flood. That's from Adult Sabbath School of Bible Study Guide for Sabbath Afternoon, April 15. Okay, so what does it tell us in Second Peter about that? Second Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And how do thieves come? Sneak. Sneaky, quiet. We don't quiet know. If we, if we knew, we would prepare, wouldn't we? Yeah. We would prevent it. Okay. On, on that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. And the earth with everything in it will vanish. Wow. Good news Bible. God has a government that is based entirely on love. He doesn't want to frighten people. He wants them to love him. But when one is talking about something as serious as the end of the world, how do you get people to take you seriously without scaring them? Seventh-day Adventists have claimed since the beginning of our church's history that the three angels' messages are our message for the world. It is to be carried by everyone, to everyone, to every part of the world. And Charles, you and I remember that the first general, con I'm sure general the first great controversy vision was given at a funeral. Someone had just faced the end of his life. So, um, wouldn't that suggest that we believe that Revelation 12 to 14, that those three chapters in the center of Revelation, are supposed to be God's final, urgent, eternal warning and preparation for Jesus' second coming? So what does Revelation 14, 7 mean saying that we are to honor God or fear Him? 
Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. That's, of course, from the King James King Version. James Version, and I love it. Revelation chapter 4, verse 7, he said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise his greatness, for the time of has come for, he, for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, seas, and the springs of water. That's a modern language version. The word fear in the Bible, I want to make this very clear for this lesson especially, the word fear in the Bible is used in many ways. It can mean anything from abject terror all the way to honor, respect, and reverence. Look at these passages to see some ways in which the word has been used in the Bible. Genesis 22, 12, and this is re re the story about Abraham taking his son up to the top of Mount Moriah and getting ready to sacrifice him. And the angel said, don't hurt the boy or do anything to him. He said, now I know that you honor, that is fear, and obey God because you have not kept back your only son from him, from our Good News Bible. Psalm 89, verse 7, you, you are feared in the council of the holy ones, and all of them stand in awe of you. Proverbs 2, verse 5, if you do, you will know what it means to fear the Lord, and you will succeed in learning about God. Ephesians 5, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Some different translation, that was in the King James Version. It's interesting to compare God's request that we love him, and respect him with Satan's challenges in Isaiah 14, 13 and 14. Can you read that for us, Jim? You are determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne uh, above the highest stars. This is talking about Satan, remember. You thought you would sit like a king on that mountain in the north where the gods assemble. You said you would climb to the tops of the clouds and be like the Almighty. Good news Bible. Okay, now let's, let's clarify what we're really talking about there. In ancient times, there were, most of the nations were polytheistic. That's a big, long, complicated word, which means they worshiped many different gods. And there was this idea that the gods would meet together at this mountain, on this mountain in the north. And that mountain in the north where the gods assemble, if you look at the Hebrew words there, and you take, turn it in, move it over into Greek, out of Hebrew and into Greek, the word is Armageddon. Think about that. So this attitude of Satan is described as the mystery of iniquity. Instead, it is the attitude of Christ who, quote, though being in the form of God, humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, as described in Philippians 2, 6 and 8, this is described as the mystery of godliness. So you see what an incredible contrast. Carrie, you want to read that for us? Philippians 2. Uh, coming from Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. He, Christ Jesus, always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross from the Good wow. News Bible. Since we are talking about the great controversy, how would you describe that in a few words? Okay, maybe we should halt for a second. Someone will give us a few word description of the great controversy? So from the Bible study guide, this comment, the essence of the great controversy revolves around submission to God. Lucifer was self-centered. He refused to submit to any authority except his own. Rather than submit to the one upon the throne, Lucifer desired to rule from the throne. Put simply, to fear God is to place him first in our thinking. It is to renounce our self-centeredness 
and pride and to live a life holy for him. Bible study guide for Sunday. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot at it. The great controversy is the conflict between God and Satan over who is telling us the truth. God or Satan? God whose very nature is love versus Satan whose very nature is selfishness. Satan does everything he can to convince humans that God is really, like he really is, selfish, abusive, and unloving, as, as Satan is. Could you explain to an individual who is that, who, why it is important to fear the Lord and do it without misrepresenting God? Have you tried that? Well, there are many passages in Scripture that suggest that to fear God means to obey Him. For example, and there's a whole list, Deuteronomy 6.2, Psalm 119, 73 and 74, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, some of them we'll read later on. So let's look specifically at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Our Bible study guide suggests that, quote, the gospel sets us free from the law's condemnation, not from our responsibility to obey it. So I would ask, if the law no longer has power to condemn, does that negate the necessity to obey it? Charles, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For it is by grace, God's grace, that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. God has made us what we are, and in our union with Christ Jesus, he has created us for a life of good, of good deeds, which He has already prepared for us to do. Now, we suggested last week that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit sat down and had planned out the life of Christ, the life of Jesus on this earth, step by step. And every night, Jesus would go in prayer and talk with His Father as they planned for the next day. Okay? Could our lives be laid out like that? Our lives? Yes. It says God has prepared things for us to do. So where does grace fit into this picture? Well, great, a Bible study guide says grace not only delivers us from the guilt of our past, but it also empowers us to live godly, obedient lives in the present. There are some people who have this strange idea that salvation by grace somehow negates the law of God or minimizes the necessity for obedience. They believe that any talk about obedience is legalism. They have declared, all I want is Jesus. The question is, which Jesus? A Jesus of our own making or the Jesus of Scripture? The Christ of Scripture never leads us to downplay His law, which is the transcript of His character. The Christ of Scripture never leads us to minimize the doctrines of the Bible, which reveal more clearly who He is and His plan for this world, from our Bible study guide for Monday. From the writings of Ellen G. White, we read, The law of love is the foundation of God's government, and the service of love the only service acceptable to heaven. God has granted freedom of will to all, endowing men with capacity to appreciate his character and therefore with ability to love him and to choose his service. So long as created beings worship God, they were in harmony throughout the universe. While love to God was supreme, love to others abounded. As there was no transgression of the law, which is the transcript of God's character, no note of discord jarred the Celestial Harmonies. Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. Jim, you want to read the next passage there? Christ offered himself and all he has, his glory, his character, to the service of those who return to their loyalty and keep the law of God. This is their only hope. Christ says definitely, I came not to destroy the law. It is a transcript of God's character, and it came to carry out its, excuse me, I came to carry out its every specification. I came to vindicate it by living it in human nature, 
giving an example of perfect obedience. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, June 13, 1900. So, in view of God's love for all of us, as spelled out in John 3.16, what does John 3.16 say? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, in the King James, of course, so that none need perish, but have ever, can have everlasting life. How do we explain this? Look at these words in light of all that. Carrie, Matthew 10? Yes. It's not in brackets. Jesus said, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It's from the New King James Wow. Version. So does that give you a nice clear picture of God? Um, <laughs> I have a buddy who uh, is not an Adventist, so we walk and we talk, of course, and so he says, hell is eternal. I guess all the Protestants now believe that. So I says, um, in whom is eternal life? Uh, Genesis right. 3, uh, no, John 3, 16, right? Eternal life is in Christ and Christ alone. So I says to my buddy, I says, so you mean to say you folk are putting Christ in hell for eternity? Because there cannot be any eternity away from Christ, yes or no? Mm -hmm. Because he is the one who gives eternal life. Mm -hmm. But eternal life is to know. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that, it, that is a process of education. Mm -hmm. Right, but there. Does that happen in hell? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they want to win through intimidation. <laughs> I think God operates on that level. So is God threatening us that he can destroy us completely in hell? No. no. Gordon, I think that's yours. From the Bible Study Guide, in an age of consumerism, when secular values have made self the center, heaven's appeal is to turn from the tyranny of self-centeredness and the bondage of self-inflated importance to place God at the center of our lives. For some, money is the center of their lives. For others, it is pleasure or power. For some, it may be sports, music, or entertainment. Revelation's message is a clarion call to fear, respect, and honor God as life's true center. Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. Okay, so how should we respond to the following advice? Matthew 6, 33, instead, be concerned about everything else with the kingdom of God and with what great, with what he requires of you. And he will provide you with all these other things. He will provide you with all these other things. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, you have been raised to life in Christ, with Christ, so we, so set your hearts on the things that are in heaven, where Christ sits on the throne at the right hand of right hand side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things here on earth. Now that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. It should be clear to anyone with a modicum of understanding of the scriptures that the central issue and the great controversy is over controlling people's minds. The final battle in the great controversy is between good and evil for control of our thoughts. Hmm. The Apostle Paul gives us the, this admonition, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2.5. The mind is the citadel of our being. Gordon would agree with that, I'm sure. God doesn't want to control people's thoughts. He wants you to Educate, you have freedom to choose. Yeah. How can you have freedom to choose if he's controlling? But he, but we need to follow, I mean, our thoughts need to be in follow, following his ideas. His, I mean, it doesn't give us permission. Well, he gives us permission to go off our own way, but it's not, it's not a good thing to do. But you will be exposed to the false concepts to, as, and the truth. And your choice is to, job is to make a choice, mm -hmm. but not through a threat or intimidation or a gun yeah. to your head or whatever. The mind is the citadel of our being, is the wellspring of our actions. The word let means to allow or to choose. It speaks of a volitional act of the will. 
the choice to have the mind of Christ is a choice to allow Jesus to shape our thinking by filling our minds with the things of eternity. Our actions reveal where our thinking process is. To fear God is to make him first in our lives. Our Bible study guide for Tuesday, April 18. So Philippians 2 verse 5, the Good News Bible has it in what words? Carrie? I'm oh, sorry, I was miles away. Yeah, uh, Philippians 2 5, the attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. That's from the Good News Bible. Go ahead. Think about how easy in one sense it is to control your thoughts, at least when you are conscious that you need to control them. Yeah. Often the problem is that unless we make a conscious effort to dwell on the right things, the things above, not things on the earth. And uh, where is it? Our minds, fallen and sinful as they are, will naturally tend toward the base things, the things of the world. Hence, we need to, as Paul said, purposely and deliberately choose, using the sacred gift of free will to dwell on the heavenly things. Is that all? Sabbath School Bible study yeah. for Tuesday, April 18. In the Western world, as well as in much of the rest of the world, advertising agencies are doing everything they can to get our attention to distract us from focusing on God. Does that mean that advertising agencies are the agents of the devil? <laughs> well, it, <laughs> quite a lot said, of them are. Hip hypocrisy is... Uh, you know, there's a lot, lot of deception going on in advertising. Yeah. The deceit well, I mean, of the whole just, world, Revelation 12, 9. Just the pure fact that they're trying to get our, you know, they're trying to, they want our attention. They're taking our attention away from, you know, what's important. So what kind of people would we be if we followed the advice that Paul gave us about living, living Christ-like lives? Philippians 4, 8 from the Good News Bible. In conclusion, my brothers and sisters, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Okay. A careful look at the use of the word glory in the Bible and passages such as give glory to God, Revelation 14, 7, which is what we're focusing on right now, shows us that they very often that shows us that very often this phrase is used in the context of judgment. Charles? Joshua chapter 7 verse 19, Joshua said to him, My son, tell the truth here before the Lord, the God of Israel, and confess. Tell me now what you have done. Don't try to hide it from me. And this, of course, is the story of Achan being, you know, mm -hmm. he was chosen by the Lots, wasn't it? Right. Casting lots. Okay. First Samuel 6, 5. The priests of the Philistines said, you must make these models of the tumors and the mice that are ravaging your country and you must give honor to the God of Israel. This is the Philistine priest mm -hmm. saying. These are the Philistine priests. The yes. The false priests telling <laughs> honor you. God. <laughs> right. Perhaps he will stop punishing you, your gods, and your land. Now this is after they had captured the Ark of God. They would taken it down there and put it in their temples, and wherever this Ark went, there were plagues. They had all sorts of problems. And the, these judges finally said, these priests, these pagan priests said, get that thing out of here. <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah 13, 15 to 16 and 16. People of Israel, the Lord has spoken. Be humble and listen to him. Honor the Lord your God before, the, before he brings darkness and you stumble in the mountains. Before he turns into, turns into deep darkness, the light you hope for. Malachi chapter 2 verse 2, you must honor me by what you do. If you will not listen to what I say, then I will bring a curse on you. I'll put a curse on the things you receive from your 
for your support. In fact, I have already put a curse on, it, on them because you do not take my command seriously. Okay. When was Malachi written? 700 BC? No, no, no. About 700, 800? 400 BC. 400 BC. About was the last book to be written in the Old Testament. Written about, and this is after they have returned from Babylonian captivity, just maybe one or two percent of the Jews were willing to go back home. And here they are already falling back into the same sins that their ancestors had been into. And they go through this whole process through, through Ezra and Nehemiah. And Malachi comes and, you know, it's just one sin after another, one sin after another. And God says, I may, I don't know how to make it any clearer. Just, and he just goes through, you do this sin, you do this. And you, what you respond, and they just mocked God each time he said something. However, we, before we get to the point of God's judgment, how does giving glory to God impact our lives on a day-by-day -day basis? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Surely you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you. So if anyone destroys God's temple, he will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you yourselves are his temple. So where do we go to see this temple? We're looking at it right here, aren't we? Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 6, 19, yes? Come in. Maybe I can share this. When I speak to the non-Christian intellectuals, you know, because they believe Ru'apak means the Holy Spirit. And I, I asked them way before, I said, can I quote the scriptures? They'll say, yes. You know, and this is the last one I end with. Yeah. You destroy his temple, he is going to destroy you. Well, would you Chap say, is God going to destroy him or God lets you self-destruct? God doesn't, it, it, yeah. human nature has gotten pretty bad. Remember, Jer well, was Jer that's the part of the first death, but the second death also, he pulls his grace away and people die. But that's, those are the natural consequences of living out of harmony, but it, that doesn't have to be overt and, and become an active agent in, 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 in death. Yeah, it's, we, we struggle with that issue because we know, we just read it uh, in our discussion last week, that God, Christ on the cross, felt his Father withdrawing his presence, and he died because of that separation from his Father. But now, he perceived that as a terrible torture. It was worse than all of his pains. But even that, what was worse is his message to his kids. They, they turned their back on it. That's it. That pained him even the most. Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. But in that particular situation, at the death of the cross, what really troubled him most of all is he couldn't feel his father's presence. And he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthaniya. My God, my God, how, why have you forsaken me? Okay, let's take another passage, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that who lives in you and who is given to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves, but to God. He bought you for a price, so use your bodies for God's glory. And then down to chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Well, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all to God's glory. So, do we eat to God's glory? Do we drink to God's glory? That's the question. What would it mean to give glory to God in our diet, our dress, entertainment, exercise, even our interactions with other people? Are we giving glory to God? Well, this doesn't mean that we have to be some kind of, you know, sacrifice on an altar somewhere. Paul made a very interesting statement in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So, who are we here? I think it's yours. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. 
So this is an active thing, isn't it? This is a true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him, and is perfect. So what could it mean to be a living sacrifice to God? In Paul's day, a sacrifice was something you burned on the altar, right? Paul was not talking about sacrifices being slaughtered on an altar, but rather a living sacrifice. The Greek word in Romans 12 is somata. That's plural for soma, which means a body. The expression reasonable service in the King James Version would be much better translated as an act of intelligent worship or an act of spiritual worship. So what's intelligent or spiritual worship? How would you describe that? It wouldn't be a ritual. It wouldn't be a ritual, that's for sure. Are we prepared to give glory to God in our minds, our bodies, and our emotions? Some of this may sound rather daunting. Is it possible for human beings to live as, it, as is being suggested? What assistance do we need when trying to live the lives of overcomers? Revelation uses the, words over, uses the word overcomers many times. That's encouraging, isn't it? After reading Revelation 14, 12, let's look at that really quick, we, just to review our thing. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Notice these words from our Bible study guide. Jim? We can overcome because he overcame. We can be victorious because he was victorious. We can triumph over temptation because he triumphed over temptation from the Bible study guide. Ellen so, White says. So who's, in our, who's our example there? Jesus. Obviously. Go ahead. Ellen White says, if we had to bear anything which Jesus did not endure, then upon that point, to me, upon this point, Satan would represent the power of God as insufficient for us. Therefore, Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are. Hebrews 4, verse 15. He endured every trial to which we are subject, and he exercised in his own behalf no power that is not freely offered to us. As man, he, has temp he met temptation and overcame in the strength given him from God. He says, I delight to do thy will. Do thy will, O oh my God. Yea, the law is within my heart. Psalm okay, I'm, go ahead. Psalm, Psalm 40, verse 8. 40, verse 8. Did, do we understand what that means? I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Do we think doing God's will is a burden? Is it a, it's trouble? Or do we really delight to do it? Well, he's listening. He says, mm -hmm. he, 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 God doesn't ask you to conjure up some idea. He, he says, listen. And mm -hmm. he gives you instructions. He gives you uh, the, mm -hmm. identifies the principles on which life is based. We we find that also in uh, in Isaiah fifty eight. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I I abhor what you're doing there. If you call Sabbath a delight, the Lord's mm -hmm. holy, the honorable. Yep. Go ahead. As he was, as he, excuse me. As he went about doing good and healing all who were afflicted by Satan, he made plain to men the character of God's law and the nature of His service. His life testifies that it is possible for us also to obey the law of God. He did not desire ages twenty-four. Okay. He did on. not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his toil. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 72. I put that in there because, and this was talking about Christ's childhood. I mean, there are people who said, well, you know, Jesus can't expect us to live the kind of life he lived because, I mean, he was God. You know, he, could, he just could sail through all these temptations, right? He did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his toil. I mean, if you're carrying a heavy burden and you're, I mean, as a carpenter, he did a lot of hard work. Did he say, no, God, you know, just please do this for me. I, I, no, he, he couldn't do that. How do you understand these words from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 and Hebrews 7, 25? Gary? Reading from it. 
chapter 4 of Hebrews and the verses of 14 through 16. Let us then hold firmly to the faith we profess, for we have a great high priest who has gone into the very presence of God, Jesus, the Son of God. Our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who has tempted, no, who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. There we will receive mercy and find grace to help us just when we need it from Good News Bible. Okay. Hebrews 7.25. Okay, we're going to compare the King James with our Good News Bible here. Have a look. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, and so he is able now and always to save those who come to God through him because he lives forever to plead with God for them. It's from the Good News Bible. Hebrews seven twenty five again, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's the King James Version. Okay, so what does it mean to plead with God for us or have intercede with God for us? I think intercession is more correct because uh, God, he, it's a communicator. He's educating. Mm -hmm. It's a process mm -hmm. that uh, he, he does. Well, do these passages suggest that Jesus understands us better than the Father does? Because for a while Jesus was here on this earth and suffered temptations as we do. Would you consider yourself an overcomer? If not, what things in your mind, if you're in your life, need to be overcome? You don't have to confess publicly here, but well, if nobody was self-centered, yeah, there wouldn't be any sin. <laughs> and the sin starts in the mind. Yes, exactly. And God promises what? Revelation 21, 7. Those who win the victory will receive this from me. I will be their God and they will be my children from the Good News Bible. And then from the Bible study guide, uh, this is a quote from Angel Manuel Rodriguez. We can summarize the force of the expression fear God in Revelation as God's final call to humanity to choose him as their glorious and majestic God, who will be victorious over the forces of evil that oppose him and his plan for the human race. This fear does not manifest itself, at least not for now, in terror and trembling, but in joyous and loving submission to God's law and to his exclusive worship. No other power should be acknowledged as worthy of such devotion and loyalty. In fact, there are no other options because what shows itself on the horizon of the cosmic conflict as possibilities are actions of demonic powers destined to extinction. References okay. are Okay. Now let's think about that for a moment. Demonic powers destined to extinction. What does that mean? Well, everything that's not of God is going to be terminated. Okay. It's going to because, be, become extinct. Extinct. Okay. I heard the term the other day that uh, entropy, basically, mm -hmm. if it's God does, doesn't sustain it, it will cease to exist. It, 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 that's not too big of a stretch, is it? No. No, it isn't. I can uh, say that many times, don't we? Yeah. It, 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 it's. I didn't come, it, it just, I'm applying what, what it, 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 yeah. a person that has not had a lot of uh, religious training. So we have the option of choosing God's side, entering into, into relationship with him, living a glorious life on this earth that may be persecution and other things, but it's a godlike life, or we can self-destruct. That's basically what we're talking about here. Gordon, you sound like you want, look like you were going to comment. Try to imagine how powerful God is. Through the amazing new Hubble and James Webb telescopes, we are repeatedly discovering how immense the universe is. 
and you all know that we have done this twice now. When the Hubble telescope first got going, really was working right, they said, okay, let's pick a spot in the universe where there's nothing. And we're going to focus this telescope just on that spot for like, I think it was two weeks. Just collect all the lights, just focus right there, and we're going to collect all the light we can gather for two weeks. See if there's anything there. See if there's anything there. And it came back with, I've forgotten exactly, but hundreds of, of stars and, and, and I think 17 galaxies in the spot. <laughs> and they, they've turned around, did the same thing with the James Webb thing. Even now that the Hubble has spelled it out in great detail, and now they, there are fewer small, you know, empty spots. But you take, the, you take the James Webb telescope, which can perceive other things outside of the normal spectrum of, of, of the eyes, and poof, there it is again. Then we read it in someone in the scriptures, Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. So, yeah. so this God, what does it mean to you to suggest that God, who created all these worlds and all those other galaxies, is going to be your judge? Do you feel comfortable realizing that he is going to be the judge? Remember that God the Father worked through Jesus Christ in the creation process. Mm -hmm. Only God can make the necessary changes in our lives. However, because He always honors our freedom, He will never work with our minds trying to change us to help us unless we invite Him. Notice these words from Ellen White. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can we, Job 44, can be, mm. Job 14, 4, Romans 8, 7. Education, culture, and an exercise of the will, human effort, and all have their proper sphere. But here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of the behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within, a new life from above, before men, men can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ. His grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of soul and attract it to God, to holiness. Okay. Ellen White steps to Christ. So, who is able to change our thinking, our minds, our, our, our characters? Christ. God, Jesus Christ but is the only one. We have to allow it. We have to allow it. That's right. That's God. salvation by works. We have to allow. <laughs> no, it's not no, 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 I'm just kidding, by the way. But, but the whole thing is that this is important, for, at least for me, yeah. that uh, his salvation is worthless unless I open my heart. This yeah. is important. Yeah. I'm not kidding. I say, you know, this is If you substitute the word, you, what you said there, uh, it's worthless. If you substitute, word, uh, substitute the word heal. For where? Instead of uh, um, salvation. Yeah. If you substitute okay. the word heal, then it takes on a different yep. point of view, doesn't well, it? Well, and so, okay, to put those two ideas together, basically we're saying, we are sin-sick people. God is willing to heal us, but we can't do it ourselves. And how does he do that? Yeah. Through education. Yeah. He, it's not a magical uh, yeah, show sure, game or whatever you, metaphor you might want to use. It's, or just forgiveness. That doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you have to exercise some mental energy to choose one way or the other. Yeah, you have. That's the one thing we can do. Yeah. God, God can present the you know through the the Bible study, through 
other materials, the spiritual materials and so forth, he can present ideas, but we have to choose. And if we choose, that's the part we do, and he makes the changes. And those, that uh, information comes not through conjuring self from no, within, no. it's from he listening, hero mm -hmm. Israel. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, we have five senses. And within, those within, our, within ourselves, we're not going to come to truth. Yeah. If we are Seventh-day Adventists and claim to be, be a part of God's end-time people, how do you think we should understand the challenge of the three angels' messages? Do we have a collective responsibility in the church to fulfill those commands? Or do we also have an individual responsibility in fulfilling those commands? Prescription. Well, we've, we've talked about how successful the church has been in the past as an organization. So how is this going to happen? Will God have an end time people? Yes, he will find faith. Even though he asked, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? The answer is yes, he will. Yes, he will. He will find faith. Okay. Would you agree that giving God, uh, giving, to, giving glory to God refers to how we live? Yes. Sure. Yes. Wouldn't that? But you got these uh, church groups together and they have praise sessions. Mm -hmm. What's the greatest praise you can do is for God is do, uh, tell the know. truth about him. Mm -hmm. Don't misrepresent him. Wouldn't that impact every aspect of our lives? It should. Of course. Do, do we glorify God in the way we eat and drink and what we take into our minds from all external sources? And dress. And Jim was just trying to import, import, you know, impress us upon the idea that how do we take, take things into our minds? Vision, hearing. Yeah. It's education. What is that, the text that goes, says, you can blaspheme the Father and the Son but, but, but if, if the Holy Spirit, yeah. I think that's a, a, a got to be a better word than blaspheme because if you don't, you can refuse to listen to the Father, you can forgive, forgive, refuse to listen to the Son, but if you reject truth, mm -hmm. He can't do anything. Yeah. He's, he honors your choice, and the choice is to, to not listen. Okay, our Bible study guide, where are we? Is that yours, Gordon? No, I was done. I think it's yours. Mine. Okay. In John 13, 17, he states, If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. A life wrapped up in self is a very small package. Being locked in the prison of our own self-centered behavior is a miserable way to live. Knowing Christ, obeying Christ, and living for something bigger than ourselves brings life's greatest joy. The one who made us has designed us to live, really live, for the delights of his kingdom. Psalm 16 verse 11 puts it this way, you will show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The SDA Bible commentary makes this insight observa insightful observation regarding the expression, fear God in Revelation 14:7. The message to fear God is especially timely in the period represented by the preaching of this angel, for men are worshiping gods of materialism and pleasure and many others of their own devising. Volume 7, page 827. So here's a study, a scientific study, a series of studies published in the journal Motivation and Emotion. T. Kasser et al., Changes in Materialism, changes in psychology, psychological well-being, evidence from three longitudinal studies and an intervention experiment showed that as people become more materialistic, think about our generation, our world today, their sense of well-being and purpose is reduced, and if they become less materialistic, it rises. While materialism is good for the economy fueling growth, it can have a negative impact on a personal level leading to anxiety and depression. Consumerism can also damage relationships, communities, and the environment. From a scientific study that's reported in our Bible study guide. Could you add 
entertainment or amusement. Yeah. We, we, we did that earlier, but yeah, it wasn't put in right here, but it should be. Yeah, yeah because um, amusement, A, against muse thinking, a state of mind. A, a state of mind where you're against <laughs> thinking. Isn't that what, isn't yeah. what amusement be? Or you, a, a rational definition? Well, what do you think? Is it possible for us to commit ourselves completely to doing God's will for our lives? And would that bring happiness? Jim? All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ, and if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity of his, to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Hold on just a second. Do we understand the implications of that sentence? If we allow, if we make Christ the focus of our minds, if we allow him to come in to, to change us, we will, could eventually get to the place where our thoughts are like his thoughts. Well, to know the Father and the Son is yeah. eternal life. Didn't, didn't Paul it's say like we have the mind of Christ? Yeah, yeah Philippians 2, 5, right? Yes, okay, go ahead, the will. The will, refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service when we know God is, excuse me, as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be life of continual obedience. Through an appreciation of the character of Christ, through a communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. Wow. The, the Bible study guide comes, oh, that by the way, the Desire of Ages uh, 668. Yeah. From the Bible study guide, to give glory to God means to honor God in our lifestyle. Giving God glory involves the recognition that we are ambassadors for Christ. We are the light of the world, the salt of the earth. The word used for glory in Revelation 14.7 is doxa. doxa. Does that come from doctrine that's, or teach, that, teaching? That, that's, that's, no, that's, no, that's a different thing. Doxa is, is the Greek word for glory. Glory, okay. This word is used regularly in the New Testament. It has, it may have been, excuse me, it may have two distinct meanings. The first meaning indicates honor, fame, or recognition. In this sense, it gives God glory. To give God. To get God glory means to give him the honor or recognition he deserves. Rightly so, for he created us, he redeems us, daily he sustains our lives, and he is coming again for us. At the same time, there is another aspect of the word doxa that is often overlooked. In some instances in the New Testament, doxa can signify brightness or glorious appearance. According to the Apostle Paul, the glory of God shone forth in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. As, the, excuse me, as his, this glory of God revealed in Christ shines forth from the gospel into the heart and mind of the believer, it transforms into him, excuse me, him into light, excuse me, into light in the oh. Lord. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, 8. Thus, we all, with open face, beholding it, excuse me, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into something, excuse me, into the same image from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. From and we use a slightly different expression to talk about that all the time. What's that other expression? By beholding, become we changed. become changed. Yeah, that's, By beholding, we become changed. Or you worship, become like that which you worship or admire. <laughs> yeah. To embody the twofold meaning, honoring God and guarding his reputation while letting the brightness of his glory shine through our lives ought to be the goal of each Christian. From the Bible wow. Study Guide, pages 53 and 54. I, I, love, I love this story. A young girl that was accustomed to worshiping in a large cathedral with stained glass windows showing scenes from the life of Christ and early disciples was asked the question, what is a saint? She thought for a moment and said, a saint is someone that the light shines through. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? 
Uh, I thought that's really good. It's say to someone that the light shines through. Mm -hmm. A double meaning. No? Yeah, it sure was. A double meaning, you think so? <laughs> How much is included in giving glory to God? Letting the light shine through, right? Does that include caring for our bodies which he has given us? Can we violate his principles of health and still give glory to God? Do we recognize that our bodies are the dwelling places of the Spirit of God? We, do. we read it up there earlier. Carrie? Our bodies become the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. This tendency is indeed an awesome thought. The third person of the Godhead takes residence in the lives of believers. Thus, to defile our bodies and willingly violate the laws of health is to dishonor our Maker. We are Christ because He created us and has redeemed us. There is another reason it is vitally important to God that we give Him glory in our health practices. Spiritually, spiritually rather, and health are closely aligned. The Holy Spirit communicates with us through the spiritual faculties of our brains. If the brain is nourished by a poor quality of blood because of poor health habits, we will be less capable of discerning the voice of the Holy Spirit. Our understanding of the plan of salvation and Bible truth will be obscured and compromised. If we are destroying our bodies because of our willful neglect of our health, our witness to the world certainly will not be one that gives God glory. Principle applies not only to our health habits, but also to the things we watch on TV and read in magazines and books. The content that occupies us on the internet and a host of other lifestyle practices. Okay, Jim, there's your comment, isn't it? It's what goes in to the mind and to the senses. Physical inaction lessens not only mental but moral power. The brain nerves that connect with the whole system are the medium to which heaven communicates with man and affects the inmost life. Whatever hinders the circulation of the electric current in the nervous system. Gordon, tell us about that anyway. <laughs> Thus weakening the vital powers and lessening, lessening mental susceptibility makes it more difficult to arouse the moral nature. Well, God is calling us to live a happy, healthy life. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these messages of hope and challenge. We want to be more like you, to let your light shine through us. Forgive us where we have failed you. May we come to recognize the importance of this third angels, these three angels' messages and how they should impact our lives and with those with whom we associate each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.